squat or a front squat. Um, probably some sort of hip hinge movement pattern, so like a Romanian deadlift or a deadlift on the ground. Um, a stepping movement pattern, so like a barbell step up or a dumbbell step up, mm-hmm. and then sort of, and then some sort of lunge derivative or movement pattern like a split squat. Um, and because of the importance and contribution that we get from um, the calf complex during running, I'd like I, I always include some form of calf and Achilles loading, so something like a loaded single leg calf raise or a calf press hold on a leg press. Um, so I think that's I think that's probably five exercises, mm. and then probably something for the upper body as well. So ah, yeah, just like chuck something in there. Yeah, <laughs> do a push some or a pull. <laughs> <laughs> we'll so yeah, some, some pull, pull ups on a bar or some some press ups, something like that. Okay, oh, well that's that's helpful, right? So we've got you know four or five exercises. We've got step ups, squats, definitely always calf and um, lunge or split squat. If people don't know what these words mean and um, just google it these are super common exercises i can sh- shove some links to videos in the description as well the yeah yeah i'm sure that would be really helpful yeah absolutely i, I mean i noticed they're very much uh you know compound you know, dumbbell. so just to introduce the listeners to you could you tell us a little bit about you and your professional work yeah, absolutely. So I am a lecturer in physiology at Loughborough University, where I also run uh, the Masters in Strength and Conditioning. Um, I've been at Loughborough for about three years now. Um, prior to that, I was working at a university in Birmingham uh, as a, a sport and exercise scientist. And then before that, I spent quite a long time, I think eight, eight or nine years at St. Mary's University uh, down in London. Um, I've very much always been a, a strength and conditioning coach. So I've worked across a lot of different sports before, but I guess I've kind of unintentionally specialised a little bit in work with middle and long distance runners Um, and actually got into research quite late in my academic career. So I started my PhD in 2014, finished it in 2018, and I was looking at the effects of strength training on uh, middle and long distance runners uh, with a focus on the post-pubertal adolescent age group. So that research obviously complemented a lot of the coaching work that I was doing. And since I've been at Loughborough, I've I've tried to carry on doing some research, trying to investigate how we can optimize performance with uh, endurance runners and how we can try and offset the risk of injury. Mm. Is that the systematic review that I was reading last week or was that a subsequent um, study? Yes. So that that was one of the papers that I had in my PhD thesis. Um, (laughs) So that was a big, big project. (laughs) Oh, it looked at me. Yeah, it was, and it 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 was very interesting. Um, I guess I'd kind of collected and read a lot of the literature in that area before I wrote it, but to do like a a proper, thorough job of. going through all of the literature fairly systematically and trying to critically examine exactly what all the studies had done and the findings that they'd produced was, was really useful for sure. Mm. And is that, because you wrote a book, um, The Science of uh, Strength yes. and Conditioning for Endurance Performance, did I get it right? <laughs> <laughs> that, that, the title you just said almost sounds like a hybrid between the two, uh, two, book, <laughs> Sorry, two well, books I've been involved title. with. <laughs> So uh, maybe that'll be the third one. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I wrote a book called Strength and Conditioning for Endurance Runners, which um, uh, I, I was the one that authored that. And I guess that was just a sort of collection of uh, my thoughts and experiences of working with uh, mid and long distance runners. Um, the main motivation being that um, I was getting quite a lot of emails and telephone calls from people that just wanted advice about strength mm. and conditioning. Um, and so, yeah, I thought the, the best way to address all of that instead of just writing replies to everyone was to write a book that I could yeah. direct people to. So <laughs> yeah, I, I think it, it served its purpose in that regard. Um, but I, I actually co-edited a book called the science of science and practice of middle and long distance running. Um, so I, I can't take full credit for that because obviously we had 36, uh, like internationally recognized experts across different topics within uh, the sort of field of, of, of middle and long distance running uh, who contributed to that book. Um, and that came out last year. So um, right. yeah, that, that was that was a slightly different project. 
Okay, and are they both written sort of for the runner? Is the second one more for sort of clinicians and coaches and stuff? Yeah, um, so the first one was, yeah, it was specifically targeting runners and coaches. So I tried to make, I tried to add a little bit of science for those that wanted to get into some of the rationale behind why we do certain things. But it, it was mainly geared towards runners and coaches. Um, whereas the science and practice of middle and long distance running is a bit more of a kind of, I guess, a scientific textbook, like a, a mm-hmm. kind of reference book. Mm-hmm. So I, I think coaches that enjoy reading about some of the latest evidence and science and how we apply that will be very interested in that book. Um, those people that just kind of want a bit more direct, practical answers, like what should I do? Mm. Um, s- some of it might be a little bit heavy going. <laughs> right, okay. Yeah, well, as you know, I put out a request to like my email list and on social media and stuff, and I was just blown away by how many questions. right. Fantastic. I got back. <laughs> so you're definitely, uh, um, you know, studying and working on an area that people are very interested in. Yep. Now, I was quite surprised by the question. So I was glad I did it because I was preparing a sort of um, topics and questions that were more about like, why, what are the effects? What are the benefits? Um, and, you know, that really wasn't what came back at all. It, it was much more um, like the how questions like how often which exercises what time of the year and that sort of reflects my own experience in the last few years I I don't know about you but I don't get resistance from runners when I suggest that they might benefit from strength training it tends to be you know practical resistance you know equipment what exercises how often that kind of stuff it's not like I don't think it'll help me um have you noticed a similar shift you know, in running generally, uh, or is it still yeah. something that's not really uh, part of the mainstream? Yeah, I, I think I largely agree with what you just said. Um, I think if we go back sort of 10, 15 years, when I first started getting into strength and conditioning coaching, and there the were definitely a lot of runners and coaches that were quite adverse to it. They had a very much old school mentality about we just need to run very, very high volumes to try to optimize our performance long term. Um, but as kind of, I guess, more scientific research started emerging, sort of case studies on very, very elite and successful athletes that published their training programs uh, or kind of articulated the benefits of doing strength training, like we've seen more runners starting to incorporate it into their own training program. And that isn't just like elite and well-trained runners right the way down to kind of grassroots and recreational seem to be engaging a little bit better with it. Um, And so, yeah, I think it is becoming a more staple part of runners programs. Um, But because they're a bit more familiar and accustomed to to doing their running, like strength and conditioning is, is, is perhaps like the slightly scary thing that they're not too sure like what they Mm. should be doing. Like, as you say, how many sets, how many reps should, how often should we be varying those sorts of exercises? And so I guess they're always kind of looking around for, I don't know whether it's magazines or internet articles or advice from um, experts about exactly what they should be doing. Mm. And, uh, you know, I have like about 3000 questions I'd love to ask right now, but I want to (laughs) respect my listeners who submitted their questions. So I'm going to, I've tried to choose some that are kind of representative, you know, because there was so many, Um, but they did broadly fall into themes. And and the big one was sort of uh, periodization, uh, Mm -hmm. volume kind of stuff. So um, if we start with this one from Blaze. Um, are there a specific amount of days per week to strength train or does it depend on the rest of your training program and do you put more strength training in the off season when you're doing less kilometers so you're ready to ramp up the kilometers when the time comes yeah it's a really good question so thanks very much to to blaze for submitting that um like if we kind of look to the the research literature on the use of strength training with with endurance athletes, it typically indicates that distance runners should be engaging at least twice a week in order to get some benefits, at least in the kind of medium term over, over a period of, of three or four months. Um, like some of the studies have used three times a week, but in my experience as a coach, that's often a little bit too much. Like runners struggle mm. to find the time to allocate three new sessions a week to, to strength and conditioning. 
But if runners can manage to squeeze in a couple of sessions a week, they're, they're very likely to get benefits over the period of a few months. Um, an area that I've become increasingly interested in, and it very much started as, I, I guess, kind of quite a practical problem, is that so runners are often, yeah, in getting, like doing running training five, six times a week. So when you tell them to add two new sessions a week, they struggle to accommodate that, um, often because of lifestyle constraints and they don't want to give up running sessions to bring in strength and conditioning type sessions. So with quite a few more recreational runners and younger runners that are obviously at school and or, or at college, I've tried to kind of micro dose the strength and conditioning through the week. So they end up almost doing something every day, hmm. um, but for quite short periods of time, just 10 to 15 minutes. Okay. So I don't have any kind of scientific research to support that approach, but they end up accumulating essentially the same amount of strength training volume um, as if you would do two additional sessions a week, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, so my experience of that type of approach is it seems to work in, in the same sort of way. So yeah. I think, yeah, I think if people can add two sessions a week, then great. If they can squeeze in smaller amounts that are spread through the training week, that probably works works just as well. Do you have trouble sort of getting warmed up enough to do something challenging? You know, so if they, uh, let's say you're putting... Uh, two exercises at the end of a 45 minute run and you only wanted to take 10 to 15 minutes will the run sort of prepare them to just kind of get into it or do they need to really kind of do some some sort of strength warm-up you know yeah I think it depends what what they end up doing um usually if a runner has been out for like a kind of recovery or, or fairly easy run um and they return and like a little bit tired but not super fatigued they're usually prepared and warm enough to do like some form of strength and conditioning work for, for 10 to 15 minutes after. Um, and, and I think that's fine for, for somebody that's, that's very busy, as, as I said before. Um, if they're just going straight into kind of one of these small units of strength training, it probably would be advisable to do some sort of short warm up, mm. e even if it's just going through the range of movement that they want to achieve in the exercises that they're going to do um, in the strength training um, uh, unit unit then, then then that's probably enough but yeah just l either loading up a bar or going straight into something that's quite intense um is probably a little bit risky so i'd do some okay. form of warm-up if, if they haven't been out for a run and the second part she was talking about um he so he was asking about uh in season versus off season which was you know an extremely common question actually yep. so what, what are your thoughts there yeah, so I, I guess it depends what the runner's targeting. So, for example, I've worked with a lot of track runners in the past. So, obviously, their competitive period is, is during the summer. Um, in, in the UK, that's, uh, well, we don't really have a summer, but it, that's the, the race. The races are typically sort of June, July and August time. So, I typically do slightly higher volumes of strength and condition work in the preparatory period, so in the off-season. Um, and then usually the maintain or for some important race weeks completely take out the strength training mm -hmm. during the in-season. Um, so you like a bit more explicit, that would usually be one maintenance session a week or at least okay. a, a session that involves some form of strength work at a, a slightly reduced volume. Um, what Blaze might be referring to is like more of a kind of single targeted peak, um, like a, a road half marathon or a marathon. Mm. Um and so you usually in that scenario, like I won't, I won't necessarily like periodize it too heavily. Like they might do a little bit more during a period where the running volume is a little bit reduced. And then when they're building up mileage to a peak, I try just to look to, to maintain the volume. And then in the two weeks leading into the, to, uh, the major race or event that they're, they're targeting, slowly taper the volume off and so they'd usually just do one main strength training session a week but again with with quite reduced volume mm -hmm. i seem to remember reading a, a study a year or two ago that looked at that and they were saying you know if you did three a week you could increase your strength i think they were doing it yeah. in the winter and then you could maintain it with a single session per week for i think they said up to like 24 weeks that i might be butchering that research is this <laughs> is this a true thing that i'm telling my clients or am i just making stuff up? yeah it seems it seems to be and you're right there have been a couple of studies that have 
done some sort of intervention and then attempted to try to maintain the gains that have been made during that intervention in a subsequent kind of, I don't know, six week period or so. And they, they usually manage to maintain um, on one session a week. Um, so that's that's pretty much chopping the volume in half compared to the intervention period. Um, I, I, I definitely deal with coaches and runners that prefer just to completely stop their strength training in the weeks leading up to a big event or during a track season. Mm. Um, and typically what the research shows with that type of scenario is that we can sort of maintain the gains that we've made, usually in running economy or speed, for a few weeks but then that starts to drop off okay so that might be disadvantageous to performance if um uh if, if the runner's giving up for a really important race so trying to do some maintenance work if it's just yeah one kind of unit of training or a, a training session a week is probably makes most sense yeah that's really helpful actually i was looking at making some programs for some of my athletes yesterday and i was like okay these two three weeks where we're tapering for these air races what should I do with their strength? You know, should I keep it in? And from what you're saying, it's like, yeah, just a lighter one that's not too, doesn't break them down, but at least one a week so that, you know, probably speculating here, but the the sort of newer muscular adaptations that you get from strength training, they don't kind of go to sleep because they're still doing those movements and they're still pushing heavy weight. Yeah, precisely. And I, I think there's this sort of slight misconception a lot of the time that, when we go to the gym, we need to be working to repetition failure, mm. squeezing out every rep, and we need to be really, really sore the next day when we wake up, which which simply isn't the case. Like we know we can get quite meaningful adaptations and like you say, maintain strength qualities on um like a fairly small volume of, of training. Um once we've kind of yeah, acquired some adaptations over a period of time. Um and so yeah, you don't necessarily need to be really tired and fatigued and sore. Uh, when you leave the gym, um, you can just do a small amount just to, as you say, I guess, kind of retain those neuromuscular adaptations that you've achieved. And uh, just to keep the flow going, that's a good time for one of my other questions was, uh, and it got a lot of like upvotes and stuff. It was, what are your top six exercises? I don't know why six, but what are they? <laughs> so, so what should runners yeah. be doing? These are always really hard questions to answer <laughs> because um, like I, I get these sorts of questions a lot from students as well, that they give you a, uh, a kind of very broad statement and then, the, yeah, they want the sort of, I, I don't know. the Come on, let's hear gold, it. What are, the, what are they six? Yeah, the, gold, <laughs> the, the golden exercise. And I, I never like saying, well, it depends. Like, give, give, me, <laughs> give me a scenario or an example because like a lot of the time when I – I, I program like it obviously is very individualized um it will depend on the athlete's training status like what their goals are what equipment they've got available what time they've got uh definitely their injury history and, and and all of these sorts of things but like all of those things aside you still want to give an answer don't you hmm. um like i think if if the strength and conditioning is being performed in a gym-based setting which ideally it should be i'll be doing some sort of squat type movement so a back squat or a front squat um probably some sort of hip hinge movement pattern so like a romanian deadlift or a deadlift from the ground um a stepping movement pattern so like a barbell step up or a dumbbell step up mm -hmm. and then sort of and then some sort of lunge derivative or movement pattern like a split squat um and because of the importance and contribution that we get from um the calf complex during running I'd like I I always include some form of calf and Achilles loading so something like a loaded single leg calf raise or a calf press hold on a leg press. Um, so I think that's I think that's probably five exercises, mm. and then probably something for the upper body as well. So ah, just chuck like something in there. Yeah, <laughs> a push or a pull. <laughs> <laughs> so running, yeah, some, some pull, pull ups on a bar or some some press ups, something like that. Okay, oh, well that's that's helpful, right? So we've got you know four or five exercises. We got step ups, squats, definitely always calf. Um, lunge or split squat if people don't know what these words mean and um, just google it these are super common exercises i can sh shove some links to videos in the description as well the yeah yeah i'm sure that would be really helpful yeah absolutely i, I mean i noticed they're very much uh you know compound you know dumbbell barbell uh free weights um not not machines you did mention the leg press you didn't mention the seated calf is uh, or the 
the hamstring curl or the quadriceps, uh, see the knee extension. Like, is that uh, the compound free weight stuff better? Yes, uh, like I would certainly say so. And I guess it is a bit of a, 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 a kind of training philosophy, but with the exception of those calf exercises that I mentioned, as you say, they're all multi-joint kind of compound movements. And so we know those have a slightly higher biomechanical similarity to what a runner's doing. And so we get some transfer of training across to the sport, um, probably a little bit better. Um, and it's, it also, I guess it's more bang for your buck in terms of, you don't want to be spending hours and hours in the gym hitting every single individual muscle group when you've got one or two exercises that can maybe do the job a little bit quicker. Mm. Um, and with, yeah, particularly with free weights exercises, we know that those recruit more fixator and stabilizer type muscle groups, um, which are also obviously used as part of, of, of running gait. So, um, yes, yeah, it's, it's important to be using like non-machine based exercises for that reason as well. So, well, before we do my question, let's do Kevin's. So I know you you have some strong opinions here. <laughs> Kevin asks, why should runners do core strength benefits? How can that impact your half and full marathon performance? How about at the end of a half or a full Ironman? What are your thoughts? Yeah, it's, um, I mean, the, the sort of term core strength or, or, or core stability is, is one term that I know it's used a lot in the fitness industry, um, but it's certainly a term that I, I try to avoid using if I can. And it's, uh, I, I guess I'd put it in my sort of room 101 of uh, fitness and, and sports science <laughs> terms in some ways. And um, yeah, I'll, I'll try to explain why I feel that way, but why also I think Kevin's question about um, like kind of core stability exercises or exercises that train the trunk probably are still quite relevant and you probably need an element of that as part of the program, but maybe for slightly different reasons uh, mm. than most people, most people realize. Um, I mean, the, I, I guess the, the term kind of core, um, like if we look at where it came from, it seemed to emerge in the early 1990s, mainly from companies that were trying to sell like fitness equipment and, implements that would train very specific muscle groups um within within the trunk um and obviously the word itself from the sort of english dictionary means i guess something sort of internal or very deep within a structure mm -hmm. like if you think of kind of like an apple core it's mm -hmm. obviously not the skin or the the fleshy part of an apple it's um it's the middle part where mm -hmm. where the pips are and so on so um yeah just just a re really basic analogy but the way that most people usually define the core is it's any muscles around the hips and the torso that control kind of lumbo pelvic position and some people say spinal position as well so that's obviously not just kind of core or very deep muscles but also includes quite superficial muscles mm -hmm. so muscles like the rectus abdominis and obliques and even muscles like latissimus dorsi and trapezius depending on how we're defining the core if you see what i mean mm -hmm. And so it gets quite messy quite quickly. And I think if you look to the scientific literature, at the way that academics and like sports medicine practitioners have defined it, it's like the, there isn't a kind of agreed definition. Mm -hmm. It's kind of quite it's it's quite vague. Um, so there, if there isn't an agreed definition, it makes it very difficult to to measure in a, in quite a valid and reliable way. Um, and so in that regard, if we, if we can't kind of define it, if we can't measure it, then it's very, very difficult to understand whether it's affecting performance and whether it's a risk factor for injury. And also if we put in an intervention, which is designed to try to improve some of the core muscles, whether that intervention's actually worked or not, if, if you kind of see what I mean. Mm -hmm. So I, I think from a, a scientific perspective, it's it's just quite a sort of poor term. Mm. Um and I mean, there have been a, some attempts within the literature to try to to measure either trunk muscular endurance or isometric strength, and then relate it to like running technique and some kinematic measures. Um, but I mean, the majority of studies don't tend to show very much link to like overuse running injuries, or if there is a link, it's not necessarily a direct link. Um, so they'll they'll maybe see a link between a core strength type measure and running kinematics and there's a specific aspect of technique that's related to an injury 
So they relate A to B and then B to C and then assume A is related to C, mm-hmm. if you see what I mean. Yeah. Yeah. So there's not necessarily a direct link between somebody's core stability and their risk of getting a certain type of injury, um, at least not in the evidence that um, that, that I've seen. Um, but if, if I guess if we are to accept that like muscles around the trunk are important, like we obviously kind of use them to stabilize the spine and the pelvis while we're running. Um, we've got to kind of think, okay, if, if it is important, like how do we train those muscles? And again, we pretty much know from the scientific literature that the best way to, to develop force in those muscles and to activate them to some extent is again with sort of multi-joint compound movements mm. that we spoke about before. Yeah. And so like my go-to exercises for core strength, again, would be squatting. It would be Romanian deadlifts and deadlifts on the ground. Um, it would be doing some form of step up and lunge, like maybe with some sort of offset load. So we're trying to maybe challenge trunk control a little bit more. So can but I those would still be my. Board? Could you explain? Yeah, that? exactly, exactly. But those what, would still be my go-to exercises. Board? Oh, sorry. Um, so I mean, holding a dumbbell just in one hand yeah. uh, compared to holding like a dumbbell in either hand. So it's kind of pulling you to one side, but you've obviously mm. got to try to maintain ankle, knee, hip alignment and uh, and, and trunk alignment. Um, I mean, having said all that, like I, I still incorporate, I guess what would be the more, like what, what Kevin might be referring to here, like more traditional trunk exercises, mainly just because with those exercises that I just listed, there's definitely sort of areas of the trunk that don't get directly hit. Um, all those exercises are what we call closed kinetic chain exercises. So we're developing force with the foot in a fixed position on the ground, which is how we develop force when we run. But we also know that the leg swings through when we mm-hmm. run and that can often like pull the trunk out of positions. So I will include some open chain exercises. So an example of that would be, so, so, so some of you listeners might have heard of a, a dead bug exercise or sort of lying on the ground doing some leg raises. Mm-hmm. So that will recruit a little bit more of the anterior or front part of the trunk. Hmm. It'll also recruit hip flexors a little bit more. So it's, I guess it's targeting and training muscles that don't get direct stimulation by doing some of those other multi-joint closed kinetic chain exercises. But um, I, I, I guess I don't refer to them as, oh, we're doing some core stability now. Mm-hmm. I, I, it's just part of a well-rounded program of strength exercises um, just to make sure we're, we're kind of hitting all areas. That's interesting. That, uh, that last bit, especially. Like I, what, what Kevin's probably referring to is core exercises you know we're thinking planks sit-ups uh bridges things like that um side planks uh ball stability stuff and it sounds like what you're saying is you know we're going to use the core yes when yeah. you do your split squats your step ups your lunges whatever and especially if you put the weight on one side like you hold a dumbbell in one side as you step up it's going to try and pull you over and your other side of your core is going to kind of steep keep you Still, I, I can see it's triggering you me using the word core there, but I want to make sure people understand what we're talking <laughs> about. <laughs> um, wh- the, the last bit was interesting to me because it's not something I have really thought about, but we do have, you know, the swing phase of the gate cycle. So you yeah. push off your foot, you're swinging the other one. And you were saying, you know, lying on your back, maybe sort of doing leg kicks or pulling your legs up that kind of stuff is going to work your abdominal muscles, your hip flexors, you know, which would certainly be considered more traditionally thought of as, as core exercises or core uh, muscles. Um, you know, um, how, how much, because, you, you know, in your top six, you didn't really have the lying on your back. Like, are we talking maybe just one exercise for that? Or do we need to do a whole session where we're doing a lot of this kind of um targeting muscles that are involved in the swing phase yeah so i mean my my personal approach would be to include one or two exercises towards the end of a normal strength training session um because like the sort of traditional core exercises that you listed off before like they're they're fairly low intensity they don't cause huge amounts of fatigue so sometimes when a runner says to me, oh, I've got three core sessions in a week, I'm kind of like, like on my program, I would typically take those out or at least incorporate bits of them into my like wider strength training sessions. If they still want to do them, I don't necessarily always have a problem with that. 
because as I say, I don't really think it's adding too much to the sort of cumulative fatigue that they're getting from their running because it's, it's quite low intensity. Mm. So if a runner wants to do some, because I don't know, they like feeling the burn in their abs kind of mm. thing. Um, or for some runners, like particularly male runners, they're like looking good with their top off or whatever. Like I've got a six pack. Yep. Like I, do, I don't necessarily have, have <laughs> a problem. Give the people what they want. Yeah, yeah. I don't necessarily have a problem with that um, because I don't think it's, yeah, like I said, I don't think it's adding too much fatigue, but it, it, typically, it typically wouldn't be something that I would program. Um, and yep. if it helps them buy into the overall S&C, it's like the, the problem for me comes when it's all they do. Like the only mm. thing that they do is like I do three and four core sessions a week. I, it's really, really important and that's it. Mm. And it's it's kind of like, well, it's yeah, it's not really a proper strength and conditioning program that. Um, so, so that, yeah, that, that that's what I would say it, it would be incorrect. Yeah, and I, I, that's the trouble is when you see an isolated arc, you, article and it's like best five core exercises for runners and then you present it to someone like you and say is th- are these good exercises for a runner to do and you'd be like well yeah but there's yeah, loads yeah. of others that yeah. are also good and it's like exactly w- what is your opportunity cost here because you're not going to do strength exercises for like four hours every day so what is your best bang for buck really is the, the question that, that we're interested in you know on yeah, that no, note, you've, it, sorry, go ahead. Exactly, you've hit the nail. I was just going to say you've you've hit the nail on the head. I completely agree that, that there's, there's not there's not really a, any such thing as a bad exercise. It's mm-hmm. just there's no need to do the same muscle group or the same exercise like repetitively if if we know it's not necessarily um, going to achieve what we want. Unless it's the calf, like I just love it. Yeah, the, the calf. The calf <laughs> arguably is is a bit more. <laughs> um we need to rebrand it though we need a like a sexy name for the calf exercises like call like you said is there's very good kind of uh i don't know it's an engaging term but a calf is is an extremely boring term anyway yeah yeah exactly yeah yeah there, there was some researchers that came up with uh, the the foot core um yep. so <laughs> I've heard that one. sort of <laughs> they were playing on the name, yeah, the name core, and applied it to the foot to try and get runners to do a bit more foot conditioning. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's. Uh, I mean, we got to think about marketing as well. We got to get people to do stuff. Yes, exactly, exactly. On on a similar note, we have a question from Ethan, who goes by the name Mister Dot Kinesiology. Uh, what are the benefits of high rep? muscular endurance training compared to low rep strength power training when it comes to injury prevention and performance enhancement? I'm going to doctor his question and stick to performance, if you don't mind, just because injury is such a big topic. I've, I've said a, there was a lot of questions about specific injuries that I have left out, but I, I didn't think it was fair. I didn't think you'd be able to really answer it, you know, without actually meeting the person involved. So um, I was yeah. thinking more performance for what we're talking about today. Yeah, sure. So yeah, this is often a really common question because I guess intuitively, if you're training for an endurance-based event, which is low intensity, it's very long duration, it would make sense that all of your training is very muscular endurance orientated. And so naturally, like if you're in a strength training environment, it would like logically make sense to do a muscular endurance type work. Um, but yeah, Again, most of the the, the scientific literature on this would suggest that doing heavier loads is more beneficial than doing lighter loads, which might sound quite surprising. But if we if we kind of take a step back for a second and think about what qualities and what adaptations that we're trying to chase with a very kind of general and non-specific type of training, so i.e. i.e. strength training, and what benefit that provides provides to a runner, that, that might be quite helpful. Um, and so we know with with endurance running that it's mainly limited by three main factors. So we've got maximal oxygen uptake, which is the amount of oxygen that we can get into the body and use to, to produce energy. We've got something called fractional utilization, which is the percentage of VO2 max that we can access for a given distance or duration. And then the most importantly, we've got running economy, which is the amount of oxygen or energy that we're using for a submaximal running intensity. And the important thing about running economy is we know that it's it's influenced by physiological factors, obviously, 
but it's also influenced by our running technique and also our neuromuscular system. And so we can obviously change neuromuscular qualities by doing strength training. And so the best way to change those is by delivering the neuromuscular system with like a fairly high level of load, like a a high level of stimulus Mm -hmm. that's going to cause an adaptation to the neuromuscular system. So that then improves running economy. And as we, as we know, running economy is an important determinant of, of endurance performance. And so what's typically the studies show is that if we do a very muscular endurance type training, we're like, we might get some improvement in strength, but it's not going to be quite as good as doing heavier loads, which are going to get a much bigger improvement in strength quite quickly. Um, so, I mean, to put some, I guess, numbers on this, um, like typically with with novices like and, and runners that, that haven't done very much resistance training before, I typically recommend kind of 10 to 12 repetitions, which sounds quite high. But we know that, well, we can virtually do anything with somebody that's that's unstrength trained and they're going to get some sort of stimulus. Mm -hmm. Like if we go much over 12 repetitions and I guess particularly over 15 repetitions, like the work becomes quite metabolic. Mm -hmm. So it's it's almost starting to simulate the type of stress that a runner is experiencing when they do running sessions. And so it sort of becomes unhelpful to us quite quickly. Um, because we're just delivering more fatigue or more stress to the same sorts of systems. So I'd I'd typically not go much over about 12, um, in my prescription at least. And then as the athlete becomes more trained, I then just tend to vary the repetition ranges a little bit. So they might have like a more of a maximal strength type block where they're going as low as maybe three repetitions and lifting quite heavy. And then sometimes they'll work a bit more in the middle ground, somewhere between about five and 10 repetitions. But yes, somewhere in that continuum seems to be a bit more beneficial than doing yeah the, the kind of high rep muscular endurance training approach. And presumably, the more reps, the lighter the weight. So you're sort of using your yes. reps there yeah. to, 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 to determine the weight because, you know, for someone who's very deconditioned, you know, to do 12 reps of a step up, they might, you know, body weight might be very fatiguing. Um, whereas someone young and fit and healthy might need to hold two 50 pound dumbbells to do the same exercise and get the fatigue by 10 to 12. But you were saying that we don't need to sort of go to failure. So how do you decide if you're going to do three sets of 12 of a step up for me, how do you know what weight I should use? Yeah, that is, that is a really good question. And Again, I guess the the scientific answer would be to work a percentage of your one repetition maximum. Nah, um, so, so I mean, simpler. like, <laughs> yeah, and and actually, you say something simple. I, I don't I don't usually measure one repetition maximum okay. <laughs> in, in my athletes anyway. So, like, I'd, I'd usually use just a very very basic rating of perceived exertion scale, um, and so ten being I can't lift the weight, I, I can't lift this this particular weight another repetition. And then five being, this is this is fairly easy. Like I could, mm. I could definitely do a few more repetitions if I wished. And so by the end of the set, I'm looking for athletes to get to about a seven or an eight usually. And that, that will usually tell me that they've got two, maybe three repetitions in reserve, um, which is probably about right. So mm, they're, okay. they're working fairly hard, but they're definitely not working to exhaustion or complete failure. Yeah, and then that sort of using that self-perceived effort helps them, you know, newer runners who are newer to strength training are probably going to be a little more conservative and uh, yes. runners who are more experienced, like I've done a lot, you know, I'll be like, I could keep going, you know, so it yeah, and it's yeah. just uh, helps people ease in, I think, to use that uh, sort of self-perceived system. Yes, absolutely. And I, I mean, the other aspect to it that... Um, I should have mentioned before is that particularly with athletes that are fairly new to resistance training like one of the main things that I'm trying to develop in the early days is just is just movement competency so just the skill of being able to execute the exercise like fairly well um, so they're targeting the right muscle groups and uh, and yeah they're not putting themselves at any, in any undue risk so the slightly higher repetition range so that kind of 10 to 12 helps with that because it allows them to um, to practice and sort of develop skill. Um, but also just going back to what you mentioned, that if we're working um, slightly sub-maximally and we're kind of under control, it means that technique's not breaking down too much when mm. we get towards the end of the set. So I think we have a good understanding of 
how to how often when to do it what kinds of exercises what kinds of weight now so that's that's really good because that's what the majority of the questions were about there was a couple about um, plyometric uh, bounding type exercises so I'll ask Luke's question. So Luke Humphrey, who it turns out is a running coach, I I Googled him and found out. Uh, He asks, regarding plyometric work, everything I understand says it should be the last four to six weeks of training segment after building a strong foundation of strength training. Would he recommend that for marathon runners? Yeah, thanks for the question, Luke. It is a really good one. And I think what Luke's outlining there is is like that is very much the sort of textbook type model where we go through some sort of yeah like muscular endurance type phase then we do a strength phase then we do some sort of explosive strength and then we go into yeah maybe, maybe something like plyometrics just before the races the race period's about to start um like I guess you the way in which essence strength and condition coaches will program is partly based on philosophy so some might adopt that type of design and model over the over a, a long term period of time. What I prefer to do, and this this is partly evidenced in the literature, is use a little bit more of a concurrent type approach, whereby the strength training techniques that I that we know work quite well for runners. So if we categorise them quite broadly into into three main areas, so that's heavy resistance training, which we've already spoken about, more explosive type resistance training, which is moving light to moderate loads very quickly and then plyometric training. So mm-hmm. that's your jumping exercises, your hopping, your bounding. So I will use all three of those sort of global mm-hmm. training areas all, all year round with, okay. with all of my runners. It's just the proportion of them will vary depending okay. upon the time of the year, depending upon how experienced the athlete is, um, their, their injury history as well is it, it, quite important. Um, so typically... They will be doing plyometrics from day one, week one, but it will be quite. It will be um, it will be low volume and low intensity. So they mm. might just be doing some skipping exercises over fifteen to twenty meters. They might be doing some sort of double footed pogo type jumps again, like very very low levels of volume. So that's quite easy. Like it's a little bit more intense than running, but it's definitely not um, Olympic triple jumper uh, type plyometrics. And so it just gives them a little bit of a taste of doing plyometrics. It provides some conditioning for the foot and the ankle. But most importantly, when I come to a phase where plyometrics is the primary outcome, um, it's not completely new to them. And they don't Mm. get a sudden shock to their system when I'm getting them jumping over hurdles or doing hops for distance. And then they get injured because they haven't done it for the previous six to nine months. And so that yeah, they'll, they'll start off with a small amount of plyometrics, and it will gradually increase in terms of volume and intensity as the training year progresses. Mm. And then equally, I'll prioritize resistance training at the start, like initially developing skill, and then gradually increasing in terms of the load that they're lifting. And then that will gradually taper off as plyometrics becomes a little bit more important. So like I would I would describe that as a more concurrent type approach, but where there is still emphasis on one particular thing. And mm. then we're just sort of varying and changing that emphasis as, as the year goes on, partly for partly just for variety and just uh, to keep motivation high. And also because it's um, uh, it, it's challenging the athlete in different ways to to get more adaptation. Mm. OK, well, that, that yeah, touches a little on the periodization stuff that you were talking about yep. at the start, where it's like, you know, if you're not doing any strength training, then just doing a simple workout once or twice a week that you just do the same thing all year round and do the yep. types of exercises and loads that we talked about and a bit of plyometrics, that's that's a lot better than nothing. But a better approach would be to try and um, have blocks, which are, are you talking about sort of four-week periods or eight-week periods yep. when you mentioned blocks? Yeah, usually four, four to six weeks. Okay. Um, yeah, we know it takes for well, for most types of adaptation. It takes three or four weeks minimum uh, to acquire them, and typically after five or so weeks, athletes are getting a bit bored of the training yeah. program. So six weeks at very most usually is uh, is sort of like a typical cycle of work. And you you might have a four to six week period where you're doing a little more explosive plyometric work, yep. still doing some strength, but not as much of the session. 
And then exactly. at a different yeah. time of the year for, you know, maybe early on um, in the preseason or whatever, you know, you, it, it's more heavy, uh, it's less explosive, it's less plyometric, but still a little bit so that we don't lose all those adaptations at any time of the year. Is that how runners should approach this? Yes, exactly. And um, what you've just mentioned there um, is also another big advantage to to programming in this concurrent type fashion that um, if you only focus on one thing at a time, so if I only go to the gym and lift heavy and I do that for maybe four or five months and then I move on to plyometrics, after maybe six six weeks or eight weeks of doing plyometrics, I've started to lose some of the strength adaptations that I've acquired mm. before. And so it's, it's, yeah, another reason or advantage to program in, in, in that way is that you, yeah, you maintain some of the qualities that you've built in previous phases. 